Right. Uh, anyway, welcome to um, you know the presentation for Bernoulli's equation. Again, I'm really sorry that it didn't work before. I tried it earlier and it seemed to be uh, promising, but then it just uh, went downhill again. I'm not sure why um, it did work before, so I'm still trying to figure out whether it's something to do with what I'm doing. Uh, I've set down, you know, reduce the resolution and things like that to give it a better chance, but it seems to be that it's either the internet provider or there's something going on with YouTube that the data is not getting through. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. I'm still going to give it a go to try and get it sorted or try and find out what the cause is. Obviously, if it's the internet provider, um, it's not much I can do about it. Right, anyway, uh, we make a start on Bernoulli's equation. Um, so the units which we're going to cover are 3.1, 3.3 and 3.4. I try to squeeze in 3.2, which is on Reynolds numbers. Um, but I think there's a little bit, I have to check it out. I think there's a little bit in the next presentation. And uh, if not, I'll um, put something up separately just on Reynolds numbers. Okay, this is Bernoulli's equation. Uh, you can see the formula here, which is a little bit horrendous, but the whole idea is you've got a, a pipe, you've got a big diameter, you've got a smaller diameter on the other side. If you put a certain amount of pressure in here, um, and uh, you can see that the pressure up here is going to be um, mm, pretty much the same, I think. It should be the same, but the flow rate is going to be different. Yeah? So because of the constriction here, there's a bigger flow rate, and it's a lot more water coming out than, uh, uh, um, obviously, uh, a lot faster. It's the same water coming out that goes in, but it comes out a lot faster. It's a little bit what you do is when you take your ho uh, your garden hose and, um, you, you know, you want to uh, have like a, a, a tiny beam of, of water coming out. And what you do is you uh, put your finger on the end of the hose to try and constrict the, um, the outlet. And you get like um, water coming out at... Um, uh, higher velocity and then with that you might be able to get some dirt of the of the dry fair or whatever so that that's really what Bernoulli's equation is, is all about okay let's have a look at Bernoulli uh, he was born in 1700s in Groningen in the Netherlands it's near the German border Groningen isn't it I think it is I think it is it's just across the border uh, I don't know, probably the, the Dutch would, would hate me for saying that he's almost German, but he, he sounds Italian, doesn't he? He's got an Italian name. Uh, he's in the Netherlands, and then he died in 1782 in Basel in Switzerland. And uh, his uh, big works, uh, the works he's written, is 1738. So he would have been just at the prime of his life. Um, and uh, the book he's written is called Hydrodynamica. And uh, within this, he defined the concept of lift in aerodynamics. And that was 165 years before the Wright brothers began to fly, which was in 1903. So it's quite an interesting stuff. So he was just looking at liquids and, you know, how would they behave and what's happening with them and, and how does it all fit together. And um, he, um, he came up with, uh, with all this stuff in his hydrodynamica. And that's been the foundation for, for flight to, today. Again, when you look at uh, what's been happening, um, especially, you know, when we look at this unit, we looked at refrigeration. It all took place in the late 1800s. By the 1920s, it was kind of widely used, uh, refrigeration. Uh, then we look at uh, power generation as well, which is all in the, um, in the, 19, um, the late 1800s, the 19th century, um, when three-phase motors came in, three-phase power generation, um, we had... Uh, Tesla doing his stuff and we had all these companies coming up with uh, DC and AC generators and uh, providing uh, electricity in um, in um, sort of in a domestic environment in, in the cities and towns and uh, th there were massive advances in those years so between um, uh, sort of the 1880s and 1920s also wireless electronics or wireless um, uh, communication took place around about that time with Marconi and that happened sort of the 18, uh, late 1800s and then when sort of the Titanic sank just before the First World War, uh, what was it, 1912, I think. Um, wireless was available, they were already using it and the technology was there. And then in the 1920s, you had like radios in your home where you could listen to a concert uh, without going to the, to the theater, to the opera. And um, so this interesting stuff which happened in these times and there was a huge amount of progress 
uh, from the 1880s to the 1920s. Yeah. And um, uh, then it got stalled a little bit and stuff uh, lingered on. And we, 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 strangely enough, got a massive amount of progress during the war years where uh, technology was uh, and research was driven to an extreme um, to try and, uh, obviously for the different parties, to try and win the war. So that there's been a massive amount. And then the next big stage, I think the next big revolution was uh, the late 60s, 70s, when uh, electronics was moved that bit further and we had small scale integration and everything was put onto microchips. And, um, and then the big revolution was the PC revolution. So when you look at the last hundred years, you get sort of decades where you had a massive change taking place within society, uh, the way people were living and also with technology. And uh, Bernoulli was one of those guys who prepared the groundwork for this to take place. Um, right. Anyway, this is a book. It's called Hydrodynamica. Um, uh, pretty colorful and, and graphic. That's what uh, was going around in the um, in the in the seventeen hundreds by uh, Danielis Bernoulli. I think um, it was written in Latin. It's interesting as well, even though Rome, the Roman Empire, by that time had been finished for about one thousand two hundred years. Uh, the the language of Rome was uh, still in use within academic circles. Um, you know, all the way to the 19th century. And it was only then that uh, we, we were using the vernacular. Just a little bit of stuff on the side. So if you lived about, uh, I don't know, 100 years ago, a little bit more, 150 years ago, and you were going into engineering, you probably would have to have a very good command of Latin. And all, uh, you know, scientific works were, were written in Latin at the time. Okay, this is Bernoulli's uh, theorem. That's the... Um, uh, let's just read it out. It's a total mechanical energy of the flowing fluid comprising the energy associated with fluid pressure, the gravitational potential, energy of elevation, and the kinetic energy of the fluid motion remains constant. Yeah. So basically what he is saying is that um, all these figures, you know, they don't change. So if you increase one, one value, another value is going to decrease. And so uh, there's a constant there. Okay, that's Bernoulli's equation. And when you look at this equation, uh, we're going to see how it's changed in a minute. So Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation states that the sum of all forms of energy in a fluid flowing along an enclosed path is the same at any two points in that path. So the assumptions are that the flow is steady and that the density is constant, so it's incompressible, which most fluids are. You can't compress them. You can compress a gas, but you can't compress fluids. And uh, the friction losses are negligible. So that's what he uh, talks about. So again, let me just go to the equation. Sum of all forms of energy in a fluid flowing along an enclosed path is the same at any two points in that path. So if you take, uh, you know, going back to um, the picture we had before, let me just go up again. So if you, uh, f I hope you can see the mouse, if you follow the mouse, um, can you see it? I don't know. I'm not sure. You should be sure. You should record it. I'm, I've got two images here. On one I can see the mouse, on the other one I, I can't. Anyway, you've got the input at the pipe, and you've got a big diameter. You've got a pressure, and you've got a flow rate. Uh, you will have a pressure here. You've got a smaller diameter at the output of this pipe here. You've got a little bit of uh, gravitational pull, so there's a little bit of height to be overcome. And um, and you've got a flow rate here as well. Yeah. And so what he says is whatever's on this side here is going to be the same on that side there. So the figures are going to be uh, equal. And that's represented through these formulas here. You know? So that's what's happening on one side, and that's what's uh, happening on the other side of the pipe. Yeah. OK, let's uh, move forward. I think I've got a big version of this image as well. OK, so that's the um, Bernoulli's principle and his equation. You know? So um, remember the pipe I've just shown you. So that's on one side of the pipe. That's on the other side of the pipe. And whatever you calculate is going to be equal on both sides. And down here, we've got the uh, breakdown of what each letter stands for. So we've got P is the static uh, pressure of fluid at that cross section. And so we've got P1, P2. So it's on one side of the pipe, on the other side of the pipe. The density of the fluid, um, this is uh, raw, the Greek letter raw, which is this one here. Uh, acceleration due to gravity is G, 
And again, that's a constant as well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute what it is. I don't know it on the top of my mind. V is the mean velocity of the fluid flow at the cross section. So that's the velocity at the cross section. So that's V. So we've got this here and we've got this there. So that's V1 and that's V2. And both of them have got to be squared. And H is the elevation head of the center of the cross section with respect to a datum. Yeah. Okay, so that's H, that's the height 1 and height 2. That's all it means. Yeah? So when you lift it up and the pressure has to go up um, a hill or goes down a hill, it increases. Up a hill, it decreases. So, um, so that's taking account of the height. And that's a theorem. Yeah? Um, right, uh, when we do the next session, you will know, or I'll sort of go into it, what you need to know and what you need to memorize for the exam. Uh, some equations are going to be given to you. Uh, some are not given to you. Some you need to memorize, some you don't. Yeah. And you have to use the right equation for the right question, which I uh, found in the past as well that people were following up on that. Okay, so we've got the diagram as well. This is a big diagram. So uh, again, you can see, I mean, you can imagine what's happening with this pipe. Yeah? So if you put some, some liquid in here and you pressurize it, um, there's going to be some Im impact on there as well. So you've got uh, high pressure down here and with the gravity, you lose a little bit of the pressure um, but uh, the flow rate is going to be increased because whatever water goes in here, it's got to come out there. And since the opening is narrower, smaller, so the only compensation can be with the flow rate. Yeah? And the flow rate in this instant will, will be uh, velocity. So you've got velocity 1, velocity 2. And you can see almost yeah, that there's going to be a difference between those two points there. Okay. Um, do we need to, to worry too much about this? The, the main thing is we need to have an understanding of what's happening with pressure, flow, um, and height inside a pipe. Yeah. So that's, that's important. Yeah. And, and all the, the things that are, are affecting it. Um, some of it is just uh, common sense, and, and uh, you will know about this. Yeah. So some of it, you know, maybe... I don't know, maybe, is it relevant for what you're doing? To some extent it is, yeah. So especially when you've got a narrowing in the pipe, you need to understand that if you've got a big pipe and it turns into a narrow pipe and um, that the flow rate increases and there's a lot more uh, water coming out, yeah, if it narrows. Okay, um, we've got a, um, a situation here where we can run some calculations. Um, so we might have a liquid in there, and we've got four meters per second it go through. And um, that's velocity one. We want to find out what velocity two is and what the pressure is. And we've got a height of five meters. And we can then sort of feed all these bits of data in the uh, in a formula. And we should get an answer. We should be able to work out what uh, V2 and P2 is. Um, Right, we've got another situation here uh, where we've got uh, a narrowing of the pipe. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, it, it doesn't take uh, too much imagination to try and figure out what's going on here. So you, you get a liquid flowing into this narrowing. So that means that the speed is going to increase and then it's going to decrease here. Yeah. So you get a high flow rate in this narrowing um, and you get a lesser flow rate. Uh, on, on either side of this narrowing. Yeah. So V2 is going to be higher than V1, and on the other side, we're going to end up with V1 as well, yeah. pretty much the same speed. That makes sense as well. Pretty much whatever goes in has got to come out at the same rate. Uh, right, anything else we need to, to, to look at this? I don't want to sort of try... I mean, when you look at these formulas, I know a lot of you uh, might freak out and think, this is not what I want to do, but... And it's not important at this stage that you uh, become a mathematical genius in, um, you know, manipulating uh, variables and changing the formula into something else and doing massive calculations. But it's more important that you understand what is going on within within pipes, and um, and that is really um, what, in my opinion, is is more important to take away from this. Okay, um, right here we've got a wing. Yeah? from an aeroplane and that's what a typical wing looks like so we've got a fairly flat surface here and then we've got this um, elevated surface here and what you find is that um, 
um, the air has got to go a longer way across this part of the wing until it joins together on this side. So, um, so the speed goes up and then the pressure goes down. So that means we've got an under pressure here and that gives an aeroplane lift. And it's quite interesting. So with that, uh, an aeroplane, in order to get lift, in order to lift up from the ground, um, you need air. Yeah, you need quite a, a good amount of air to do this. The thinner the air is, um, the effects slightly change. Uh, so obviously there's less resistance to the plane and it can go a lot faster, but um, uh, but also the the lift and everything is going to be affected or the amount of lift you can get. And so, uh, I mean, you've seen flaps and things like that on planes to try and generate lift at low speeds or at high speeds and, and so on. But anyway, that's the concept of an aeroplane. So you uh, have got a, a lower pressure on this side than you've got on that side, and that means it'll lift the aeroplane up uh, and you get some, some lift. The aeroplane pushes upwards. Quite a clever design. All down to Bernoulli's equation. This is what, what he's come up with. Okay, I'm not going to uh, play this. Um, I'll... Um, hmm... Um, let me see what I can can do this um, for just a little bit. See what that comes up. Um, right. So that's what this guy is. There should be some printing coming up in a moment. Uh, and it's Lesson 8, Adventures with Bernoulli's dem Demonstration in Physics. Just remember this. I would really like you to, to see this. Um, the channel, let's have a look whether we've got this here. Um, I don't find the channel name. I can't see it. Oh, it's Pro Professor Julius Summer Miller and go for Bernoulli. So if you go to Google and you put this in, Professor Julius Summer Miller, um, and uh, lesson eight, um, it comes up with Bernoulli's equation. He does some really interesting experiments. It's probably a lot better than the stuff we've seen before. Um, but uh, it's just a lot of things which just don't make sense. But again, you use Bernoulli's equation with the pressure differential, and then it all kicks in. I'm not going to play this on here because of uh, YouTube limitations. So they might um, cause some problems or delete the video or something uh, to do with copyright. Um, okay. Uh, right. Uh, task. Um, again, we've got a, a task here and I'll leave it up to you whether you want to do this or not. Uh, there's a water tank that has a height of one meter and is full of water. A tap is positioned 10 centimeters above the bottom of the tank. When you open the tap, um, what is the flow rate of the water? Yeah. Okay, so you want to know what is the flow rate of the, the, the water. Um, and um, we are dis disregarding quite a lot of information, but we just want to know how much water is going to come out, you know, how many, uh, you know, with the opening. And we can use Bernoulli's equation. That is the equation here. So we've got P1 over PG and uh, uh, all the, the constants. So if you go back to this presentation, if you go on YouTube, you just uh, move back through the formula. Uh, you should um, be able to see the whole formula and you can get the breakdown as well, you know, pressure, uh, velocity, gravity, and so on. Uh, you need this figure here, which is uh, G, which is 9.18 meters per uh, square second, or second squared. Um, and um, anyway, that's uh, the flow rate. Obviously, when you open the tap, if it's a small hole, there's only going to be a small bit of water coming out. Um, if it's a big hole, it's a big one, but, but that's what the... Uh, the, the velocity of the water is going to be like. Okay, um, I'm going to go one slide further. Um, this is the uh, breakdown of the formula. Um, we assume that the pressure is going to be the same. Yeah? And then we come down with this formula here. So V1 is zero since the liquid is not moving in the tank. So there's no velocity at the moment. So we don't have to worry about V1 and V2. Uh, P1 and P2 can be removed as the pressure is equal. Um, and then what we are left with is um, H1 um, and then V squared divided by 2G plus H2. Um, if you want to 
crack it at this stage. Uh, I would like you to stop the formula and see what you can come up with. Uh, stop the formula. Stop the video and see what you can come up with. Uh, you need to transpose the formula for V2. That's what you're looking for. And um, and see whether you can do the transposition and, and then just do the number crunching. It's not very hard once you see how it's done. So please stop the video now and uh, try to resolve this problem. And uh, then start again when you think you've got the answer. I'm going to show you what the answer is now. Uh, so that's the formula when it's uh, uh, transposed. So we've got 2G, um, open bracket H1 minus H2. So that's the height. So H1 is one meter. And then we've got the other height, uh, which is uh, um, 10 centimeters. So it's minus 10 centimeters. So the total height is 90 centimeters or 0.9 meters. Um, 2G is two times gravity. Um, right, I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, this is what I did. Um, so you, it shouldn't be meters squared. It should just be meters per second. That's the result. So it's uh, you do the number crunching. Let me just go through. So you've got the formula here. You've got what each of these bits stand for. Height is going to be 0.9 meters. So it's going to be, uh, when you break it down, two times uh, gravity. And then in brackets, one meter minus uh, 0.1 meters, which is 0.9 meters. You multiply um, that figure with that figure. You get 17.658 take the square root and you get 4.2. So V2 is equal to 4.2 and should be meters um, per second, not meters per second squared. So it's going to be meters per second. Um, okay, so that's uh, what we would have uh, equated to. That's the calculation. Um, I'm not sure what it is in the exam. Um, whatever it is, we'll, we'll crack it and, and we'll go... Um, We'll go through it uh, for um, for the exam prep. So we even when you come back to do the exam, we'll still have a couple of sessions to just prepare you for the exam. Okay, uh, what will the uh, flow of liquids? What will affect the flow of liquids through a pipe? So it's a different subject now, and I want you to think about it. What will affect the flow of liquids through pipes? Just for a moment. Um, Okay, so if you put a liquid through a pipe, what's going to affect it? Think garden hose, what's affecting the flow through a garden hose? Um, the obvious answer might be somebody stepping on it, or you know, if it's all curled up maybe a little bit. If you put uh, a kink into a garden hose, it'll affect the flow. Um, similar with uh, pipes as well, if you've got an obstruction inside the hose, yeah, if somebody puts something inside of it, it'll affected okay uh right okay i didn't see expect this i've just put this presentation together i hope you can see this okay so what we have is we've got differences in pressure we've got the fluid viscosity um so we've got thinner thick liquids so it depends whether the liquid is thick or thin uh difference in pressure as well so you've got high pressure on one end of the pipe and no pressure on the other end <clears throat> the water can gush through. If the pressure on the other side is the same as on um, you know, the input, it's the same as the pressure on the output, then no liquid and no viscosity is coming out. The pipe diameter will have uh, an impact as well. Yeah? So that will affect the flow. So the bigger the diameter, the lesser resistance to the flow, the easier it is for the flow to take place. And then obviously the opposite as well. If you've got a constriction in a pipe, yeah? the pipe narrows, so that will affect the flow in pipes. Bends in the pipe as well. Uh, obstructions inside the pipe. Uh, and then we've got the capacity of the pump as well. So if you've got a very powerful pump, which can generate a good pressure, uh, you can increase the flow rate. Uh, also the efficiency of the pump. If the pump gets old and weary and you get like uh, um, problems with the, uh, the pump that... Uh, it doesn't seal 100%, so the pressure buildup is not quite as good, and then uh, obviously the flow rate is affected by that. So uh, how good the pump is will affect the pressure rate. Okay, um, right, we've got uh, cavitation, and that's the next bit we need to talk about. Um, and again, uh, I was using um, a different 
software. I didn't realize that these nasty little images are coming at, at the back of it. So I have to sort it out. But you can see the images here. So cavitation is a, is a big, big problem. And, um, and it's to do with bubbles. Um, that's, to put it in a simple word, it's uh, bubbles are generated or are produced within pressurized systems and they cause um, cavities, um, cavitation. Cavitation, you've probably heard cavities when you've got a problem with your teeth. Um, and uh, if, um, if um, you get cavities in your teeth, you've got like little holes in your teeth and, and that's the same what, what we get here as well. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. So what's happening is we've got um, a pressurized fluid. You can see this here. So you've got a flow, then we get a restriction. And when the restriction uh, is over, what we've learned as far as Benoli is concerned is that the flow rate increases. Uh, so we've got reduced pressure, so the pressure goes down and, and so the flow rate increases and the flow rate uh, again slows down and as the liquid expands, um, small empty spaces are produced and, and we get sort of bubbles inside the liquid, which might just be, um, um, you know, tiny, tiny air bubbles in there, which, which form. Um, then if you've got an opening somewhere, the large bubbles escape, micro bubbles span on. So you may think, what is the, the issue? And uh, why are we talking about this? And the problem is it actually destroys uh, actuators. So if you've got a propeller or a pump or something and you get cavitation, over time it'll destroy it. Yeah. Again, we're going to see in a minute why as well. I've got a small diagram. But anyway, cavitation is a big problem with pumps, with propellers. And uh, you need to be aware of this. And um, if you see a certain type of damage when you take a pump apart, it may be down to cavitation and there are a few things you can do with it. Okay, so this is what cavitation looks like for real. So you can see this on here. We've got um, a sort of damage to the, to the, um, the blades or to the pump. You can see this here as well. I, I don't know whether you can see the cursor. You can see this down here. Uh, when you look at the propeller very carefully, you can see that there are some black spots on there. And uh, and that's all down to cavitation. So it's just down to, um, um, you know, you have got a high pressure and the pressure is released and bubbles are formed inside the liquid. And um, and uh, and that causes problems for the um, for for the actuators, yeah, for the blades. Again, you can see this here, you can see this on a shaft here, where you're dealing with um, cavitation. Again, cavitation just means uh, little holes. Uh, and you can see this here as well, you know, the damage it does. Uh, the same here as well. So that is an issue of cavitation. And it's, um, again, just to go back, it, uh, it is a result of pressurizing some something. And um, then the pressure is released. And then those bubbles are formed. Yeah, it's almost like in a fridge. Uh, when we looked at refrigeration, you've got a similar thing. When uh, the pressure is released, you get uh, with the refrigerant, uh, you get a mixture of uh, of gas and liquid. Yeah, and this is similar concept here as well. We're we're looking at in a fridge. That's something which we need and which we want. Um, within a pumped environment or when you use a propeller as something you need to, to deal with. Yeah? Otherwise it destroys your hardware. Okay, um, what is cavitation? Why does it come across? So it's uh, the pressure of liquid drops suddenly. Yeah? Liquid is pushed quicker than it can react. Low pressure area is left behind. And then bubbles are formed. So that's what it is. So the pressure of liquid drops, then the liquid is pushed quicker than it can react. And, uh, and then you get a low pressure area. And in this low pressure area, bubbles are formed. Uh, cannot be filled up with liquid, so it's filled up with uh, with emptiness, with uh, uh, a vacuum or air, whatever it may be. So anyway, because there's this air there, then the bubbles collapse, producing a shock wave. Uh, and that is a problem. So the bubbles collapse, producing a shock wave. So it's a bit like, uh, you know, you've got this lower pressure, the liquid spreads out, you get this uh, empty holes, yeah, holes in the liquid. And, and obviously, um, um, the, 
uh, if you've got like an empty space and you've got liquid in there, the liquid will sort of rush together to fill this empty space and that's quite violent. So it, this generates a shock wave. And then the shock wave causes damage to the actuator. So that could be the propeller or um, the veins of a pump, you know, of a vein pump or if it's a centrifugal pump, same thing. Uh, so generally, cavitation is bad for actuators, like for everything that tries to push the liquid. It's, it's pretty bad and you try, need to try to get rid of it. Um, but then there's also another side of cavitation and they actually use it for uh, cleaning, clearing deposits or to break up dirt. Uh, I've heard they use the same concept of, um, I think they use ultrasound for that and they use the same concept of cavitation um, where they have like pulses of ultrasound and they can break up your kidney stones with that. So to make it a lot easier for your body to um, um, to deal with that. Okay, I think uh, we are done with this presentation. So that's some cavitation, something uh, we needed to to talk about. There's going to be an exam question on this, so you need to talk. Got to do with bubbles, uh, which are formed because of a pressure differential, and um, uh, the bubbles will um, or you know the um, the um, bubbles which are formed collapse yeah, and this in turn generates a shockwave which in turn over time can, can damage actuators and cause damage to them. Right, and that's all. I hope uh, you enjoyed this little talk. Uh, it wasn't too mathematical. Um, again, when we do the next talk and we look at uh, the exam questions, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, not the exam questions, but the exam prep, we'll uh, cover all these bits as well and you you will uh, know what to use and what you need to know for the exam. Okay, that's all. Uh, see you then. Bye-bye.